If you want me to do what with this photograph? Put antlers on it. I don't want your photograph. I don't need your photograph. I love that Josh Groban, personally. <laughs> You're listening to the Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of... I almost said that gets my goat, because that's pretty much all we do anymore. Uh... Welcome to another episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Big Anklevich. Char. And I am Rish Outfield. All right. So here we are together again. Hopefully this won't be the last show at Charburger. <laughs> how, how have you been, man? I have been good. How about you? Yeah, I, th- I think I've been good. It, it seems like it's been a long time since we've done an episode, but... You and I just recorded last week, so... Uh, it's- yeah, that was the, uh, the the story half of this episode that we recorded on. You know, time marches on. I'm older now, officially, so that kind of sucks. You're older this week than you were last week? Yeah, I- I'm and- older than I've ever been. And now you're even older. Now I'm even older. Now you're even older? Yes older than I've ever been and now I'm older still we'll just cut that short there well, I don't know uh, there, there may be people that uh, have been thinking about suicide and they just need a push <laughs> and maybe we could talk about that um, but uh, yeah for one minute starting at Mark let's talk about your your latest birthday and the decision that you have come to you ready and Mark oh okay my uh, stammering is going to use up all the time. And basically, um, I have a tendency to make my New Year's resolutions at my birthdays instead of at New Year's. I guess I feel like, oh, I've, I've made it to this milestone. And so I feel like I should do something this year of my life. Because, you know, the calendar years don't really mean as much to me as my birthday years do. Because, you know, they started on the first one. But anyway, I was thinking that it would be interesting to make this year my year for writing. Yes, I've said so many times I would be a writer. Yes, I have to write something and say you're writing. You can take that Twitter. Where I can write. You're writing. 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 You're I guess, okay, we're done. So you really don't want to talk about it? <laughs> I'll talk about it. <laughs> hey, oh, Big, you talked for a little bit more than a minute, so I kind of had to speed you up a, just just a tiny bit to fit into that minute. So I sound like weird, like a chipmunk? More like the Micro Machines guy <laughs> stuck with a cattle prod. Oh. Maybe, maybe after the story, would you mind repeating now that? Just at like a, a regular human pace? Yeah, yeah, that might that might be a good idea. Okay, so uh, let's let's just pretend that that last awkward minute didn't uh, exist. Good idea. Uh, in fact, we could pretend that the last awkward ten years of this podcast didn't exist. <laughs> Most of our listeners are way ahead of you. Yes, yes, they are. We did do a story today, though. We brought you a story today, and uh, it's a it's a doozy. It's a story by Rish Outfield, and the story is called Last Lunch at Charburger. And you know Rish Outfield well, so we don't really need to do any real about the author, any getting you to know him. You can find other Rish Outfield stories on the Steef Audio Fiction Magazine, however, if, if you're interested in more after you've heard this one. Anything else we should say before we send them on their way to listen to the story? No, I, 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 not that I can think of. All right. So here we go. Last Lunch at Charburger by Rish Outfield. Hope you enjoy it. Last Lunch at Charburger by Rish Outfield. I'll admit it. I picked the restaurant. It's time for Ricky and me to have our conversation. So, as soon as we get off the air, I mention Charburger to him. I noticed it when I got detoured on my drive home. Ate there once and was pretty impressed. I like food. A lot. And suggested we stop by there that afternoon. Ricky agreed. But I have to wait for him while he recorded one of his gushing, insincere testimonials for a product he had never even considered using. 
playing with my phone in the station break room, eating carrot sticks once the donuts were gone. Hell kind of name is Charburger, Ricky asks as we head to the parking lot. It took longer than he said it would to record the ads, but then everything does. It must be ironic, like Fat Burger or the Greasy Spooner. Yeah, but didn't the Greasy Spooner shut down, though? He asks, and he knows damn well it was because the owner got caught with a high school girl at the local Holiday Inn, and not because of anything wrong with their food. Char is a a bad thing, right? Well, I think it can be taken as... He doesn't wait for my answer. Nobody would go to a place called Overcooked Meat Emporium, would they? Some people might be curious. Like buying a stereo from Crazy Eddie's or that clothes store in the mall called Torrid. Uh, Torrid means hot sex. Rick clarifies. Sweltering intercourse involving sweat. Char means burned. Apparently, he thinks we're still on the air. Okay, Ricky... I say, before we've reached our car, where do you want to go? He considers saying something hilarious, at least in his mind, but shrugs and says, Uh, How about Charburger? Down on State, is it? Yep. We climb into our separate cars and head to lunch. Somehow, I beat him to State Street, and I'm just coming out of the place's restroom when Ricky arrives. Hoo-wee, do I love public toilets! He all but shouts in that no longer acceptable voice he does. I wince slightly as he continues. And I mean love em, Bugs. Truck stops, restaurants, bus terminals, outhouses, glory holes. Knock it off, I say, hoping none of the customers is listening. There's a reason we retired the scat fan Crothers character on the show. The kid behind the register is tall, thin, with pitch black hair that doesn't match his eyebrows or lashes, and cheekbones as hollowed out as the bad guy in Star Wars. His name tag says Justin with a Y, and I momentarily wonder if it's pronounced Justin or Justine. His eyes meet mine for a split second and dart elsewhere. Thank you for choosing Charburger. Will you be dining in or to go? Char? Dining in, I say, and the kid says the first of at least three strange things. You sure? He asks. Uh, Yep. Okay. Well, welcome to Charburger. Would you like to try our Lone Star BBQ burger? Uh, no thanks. I'll have the blue bacon burger, please. I add the... Please, because the kid is acting really twitchy. I had a cousin on crystal meth, and he acted that way if he'd just had a hit. Or if he hadn't had one in too long. Would you like that in a char combo, char? Sure. He asks me if I'd like to double-size the drink in char fries for only a dollar more. I've been to my share of fast food restaurants. Maybe more than my share, judging by my waistline. And the suggestive cell thing always irritates me. And this kid does it so woodenly. It's like he's being monitored and the slightest omission will result in his termination. In this case, though, it still has the desired effect. Yeah, okay. Excellent choice, Char, the kid says. And I wonder if he's joking or playing some kind of game with me. He takes my money and says... Charful day to you, sir. Uh, You too, I say awkwardly. He gives me my drink cup and Rick steps up to the register. Hey there. Uh, I guess I'll have... uh... The kid interrupts him. Thanks for choosing Charburger. Would you like to try our double Lone Star BBQ burger? No, thanks. I'll just have a regular size cheeseburger combo. No onions. Would you like that in a combo, Char? Uh, yeah. That's why I said a cheeseburger combo. The boy reddens. He's maybe 17 or so, and probably his first job. Sorry, they make us say that. Okay, says my friend. Can you get no onions on that for me? 
would you like to double size your drink and fries for only a dollar more? No, thanks. Regular size. Did you get the, they make us ask that too, char? Do they make you put char into every sentence too? Ricky asks just as nastily as can be. At his best, uh, my radio show partner is bitingly clever. The rest of the time, he sounds like every Seth MacFarlane character ever created. The boy seems taken aback. Uh, uh, no. What do you mean? It's definitely his first job. Nothing. Uh, Hey, did you get no onions on that? Uh, On what? Did you want onion char rings? No. Ricky says. Just on my char cheeseburger. The kid blinks. You want onion rings on the cheeseburger? No onion rings. It already comes with onions. Explains the kid. Ricky is halfway between exasperated and amused now. Can you do something about that? No onions. All right, Char. Char, yes. Will that be... To dine in or to go? The kid asks. I have realized he owed me a large drink instead of a small one, so I stand there, waiting for this Abbott and Costello routine to end. Ricky gestures at me. We're here together. The kid looks at me, nods politely, then back to Ricky. So, dine in or to go? Is it your first day? Ricky asks. And he sounds really sympathetic, so I know he's feigning sensitivity. No, I've been here for... The kid actually starts to think about it. Never mind. Justine? Ricky says, deliberately saying it the girl way. What's my total? I... I'm not... The kid looks down at the register. Oh, that'll be 1341. Ricky stares, most of his good humor gone. That can't be right. It says right there, the cheeseburger combo, sorry, the char cheeseburger combo is $8.49. Yes, but with tax... No! Ricky all but growls. Luckily, there's nobody in line after him. They would find this little vaudeville act even less hilarious than I do. Oh. Says the kid, noting something. I put onion char rings on there. Sorry. He presses a button. All right. That'll be 902. Uh-huh. My friend does not move to pay. The boy thinks it's his fault, and I felt sorry for him before. That'll be 902, please. And uh, am I going to find any onions? Oh, no, I I deleted the char rings. I'm not talking about char rings, am I? Ricky says, and I can even see Seth MacFarlane's smug Peter Brady face when he says it. What will I not find on my cheeseburger, char? The kid could have said anything, made a joke about it, but instead he says, The char cheeseburger has a quarter pound beef patty, lettuce, char sauce, pickles, tomato, onion, And a slice of grade A Wisconsin... No, little girl. Seth says. No onions. Mine will have no onions or I'll get my money back. And the two of us will talk all about this on tomorrow's show. Show? The kid asks. And if Ricky actually says, do you know who I am? I'm heading for the car now. Can I uh, speak to your manager, Chari? Justin gasps and then lowers his head. An altar boy caught chugging sacramental wine behind the dais. He slinks away. Ricky looks over at me. Did you get any of that? I don't take the bait. I I was checking the score. He wrinkles his nose. Sun's playing again? I don't tell him that they wouldn't be playing at one in the afternoon. Because the kid has come back. A cute, auburn-haired girl with glasses who looks even younger than Justin steps up to the register with him. Still, no customers have come in after us, thank God. Sir, uh, is there anything I can help you with? She asks, and Ricky looks down at her breast. Or her name tag. Hey there, Ronan. 
I just want a cheeseburger with no onions. She smiles prettily, pointing at the machine to explain to Justin how to do his job. Just press the, uh, oh, you already did, sans onion. You got it. All right. The kid says, still sounding like a kicked puppy. I had char rings on there, but I deleted them. The girl looks back over at Ricky. There you go. Sorry about that. She turns her brown eyes to me. Anything for you, sir? It occurs to me that my wife might have looked like this in high school if I'd known her then. I genuinely stammer. Uh, I need a bigger drink. I had a large. Oh, terribly sorry. Here you go. She takes the large cup, at least 42 ounces, maybe 48, and hands it over. I hold out my 16-ounce one, but she shakes her head. Keep it. Hmm, what am I going to do with two drinks? I hand mine over to Ricky. Here you go. Now you don't have to buy one. The kid, Justin, interrupts me. The uh, charred burger combos all come with a beverage. Ricky is exasperated, but the sight of the smiling jailbait manager has made him unwilling to argue. It occurs to me that that's probably the intention. Okay, uh, thanks, guys. He says. Nine, what was it? The girl sidesteps so the kid can resume his duties, and he repeats the total. Nine oh two, please. Ricky pays and gets a second drink up, which he leaves on the counter. Thanks for charring at Charburger. Eating, I mean. The kid splutters. And Ricky can't help but say, Uh, Same to you. Char thee well before going over to fill his cup. My meal is already cooked and waiting on the counter. Not sure how long it's been sitting there. Blue bacon, Ricky says. Sounds disgusting. It's not. Why is it blue? Do they just use food coloring, or has it been out in the sun all day? Blue cheese. It's blue cheese and bacon. Well, why don't they call it bacon and blue, Or blue cheese and bacon instead of confusing everyone. Only you're confused, I say, filling up my huge cup with soda. Everybody else gets it. And what's with Char? Eh, He's probably nervous because you're a celebrity, I lie. With a kid? He doesn't know me from Ryan Seacrest. I lower my voice. Well, he's obviously somewhere on the you-know-what spectrum, I say. Which... Should be unnecessary. No, not MC Stammer over there. Rick says. The word char. Yes, it has negative connotations, I know. He snorts. Thank you. But why are only a couple things on the menu called char something? Why aren't they char shakes? Because milkshakes are cold, I speculate. You only char some... He keeps going as we proceed to the ketchup counter. Oh, I know it's stupid, but at least be consistent. Save it for the show, I sigh. His shtick is super popular on the radio, but in life, it's pretty draining. Exhausting sometimes. There's only three or four other customers in the whole joint, so we can sit where we like. Unfortunately, few of the tables have been cleared or cleaned, so we end up plopping down, not in a private booth off to the side to have our hopefully discussion, not argument, but right in the middle of the dining area. I eat a couple of fries, patiently watching Ricky lay out napkins in that way of his, as though he grew up too poor to afford plates. I take a sip of my soda and then set it aside. So, let's hear it, I say. Hear what? He asks. You want to go to Albuquerque? Yes. Of course I do. And he's surprised. What? You you don't? (sighs) I want to work less, not more. I just signed up to be Kieran's soccer coach. That ties me up in the afternoons. And I'd frankly rather be doing that than a second show. Uh, It wouldn't be a second show, Ben. What? At the very least, we'd have to do bumpers twice, one for Mesa and one for Albuquerque. No thanks. He puts a fresh fry in the ketchup, but not in his mouth. No, 
We just do Albuquerque. Oh, no. I should have anticipated this. To Ricky, nothing is sacred. You mean move to New Mexico? Of course. That's easy for you to say. You haven't got kids in school or a sister down the block or a wife with friends in the neighborhood, yoga twice a week, a pottery class that you can't shut up about. I guarantee there's pottery in Albuquerque. He says. Unless that's a euphemism for her banging some dude out of the community college. It's not. And don't say banging. You sound like Howard Stern. I wish. He means it, too. What about Phoenix? That drives nothing. Ricky makes a wet, somehow disappointed sound with his mouth. There isn't an offer from Phoenix. The opportunity knocking is in New Mexico. Hold up. I never even considered my... He has stopped looking at me and is now looking past me. What? It's the kid. He stage whispers and gestures. The psycho kid. I turn. The teen who rang us up is wiping down tables, visibly twitching. I wouldn't go so far as to call him a psycho, but he's definitely got some kind of disorder. He snarls just loud enough for us to hear. No, mop and wipe, Justin. That's the priority. Sure, Claude, I'll get right on that. Char. God, what a shame, I say, turning back to my friend. Yeah, who names that kid Claude? That's not what I begin, but shake my head and take a big bite of my burger. That was a mistake, since it gives Ricky the chance to riff. You know, I, I think I really got to him. The guy turned practically chartreuse. I take another bite. Chartreuse means yellow. Ricky takes it in stride. Well, that's what I meant. You know, I think he may have overcharged me. The girl read the same total. No, the kid. He overcharged me. Ah, I get it now. Uh Uh-huh. Behavior like that can get him... what? I don't know, I say. Discharged, don't you think? Better not, I say, playing along. You'll ruin his charmed life. Well... He does have a sharp mind. And he's so good at that parlor game. Uh, What do you call it? I shake my head. Charades. He's great at it. Seems to me he's high on the autism chart, I say, and wish I hadn't. It's a stupid bit we're doing. The kind we might open up the phone lines for help on. And how they'd light up. Nah, he's faking. He's a charlatan. I throw in. Not exactly Prince Charming, that one. (laughs) Guy's been squeezing the charmin a little too much. If you know what I mean. Come on, show a little charity, I say. Though I know that one doesn't really work. Well, I am. After all, his parents were eaten by charks. I crane my neck to see if the unfortunate employee can hear us, but he's gone back to his cashiering duties. You know what NFL team he loves? San Diego Chargers. Oh, yeah. Ricky says, grinning. (laughs) You know what his favorite book is? Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You sure it's not Charlemagne? I ask. Ricky is loving this. Uh, He plays that video game. What's it called? Oh, yeah, yeah, Uncharted. I don't laugh. I just want to eat and argue in that order. And his favorite band? Ricky asks. Good Charlotte. I don't know who that is, I admit. He goes on. Uh, You know what his favorite TV show probably is? No, and I don't care. Charles in charge. (laughs) He says, and I barely chuckle. All right, man, enough. No, 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 come on. He says. One more. And I let him. He was walking funny there. I think he may have charted. He should have quit while he was ahead. 
I wipe my mouth with my napkin. Okay, Rick, listen to me. I'm not moving to Albuquerque. I told Marjorie about it, and she thought I was joking. The kids shit a brick, and I had to tell them I was joking. Uh, shat a brick, Ben. He corrects. Totally serious. But just buy diapers. And who cares? You kids aren't the breadwinners. You are. Albuquerque is a major market, and they are... It is not a major market, I say. I know the stats way better than he does. He rolls his eyes. <laughs> They're New York City compared to here. Not compared to Phoenix. The paycheck is major compared to Phoenix, he says. And they want you. Us. They want Big Ben and Ricky in the mornings, which we've called ourselves for going on eight years. Look, I get it, Rick says, then demonstrates he doesn't get it. It's like you're a minor league baseball player, you can't pitch like you used to, and finally, the majors have come calling. It's nothing like that, I say, and I played football in high school. If you got a promotion at any other job, would you have to run it by your kids? I throw up my hands, trying not to be loud or lose my temper, even though there are barely any customers here. This is different, and you know it. Moving for you is simple, but my family will not go so easily into that good night. He squints, hating my literary reference. Okay. If it's not from a Scorsese movie or a double entendre, it'll be lost on him. Ricky is the funny, irresponsible, creative half of our partnership. I am the brains, the dependable one, the one who has to figure out how each show will work and when and on time. We've got favored nations contracts, and we both make the same for the show, except Ricky does commercials, all sorts of them. And I've always hated that part of broadcasting. Besides, I say, Marjorie wouldn't be thrilled with the weather in New Mexico. What? He asks, comically bugging his eyes out. Look outside. It's 96 out there. In April. Char-de-har-har. -har. Ricky straightens his shoulders in that way he has on the air. Here it is. Now comes the part where he threatens to go on his own. That it would be all or nothing for me. That the train is leaving and the engineer already shouted all aboard five minutes ago. <sighs> I could almost finish his argument for him. Rick Entwistle has always felt he was the star of the show. Ever since we first started taking calls and the listeners would tell him how funny he was and could he please do the horny Pee Wee Herman voice again. But the show wouldn't even have existed without me. I had gotten him the job at that first shitty college radio station where I'd begun as a student. And I was the one who planned the shows, did the research, made sure he knew what the daily topics would be so he could open his big mouth and spew forth his brilliance. If not for me, he'd have been fired that first time he said Jew me down on our second afternoon drive show. The only thing keeping him around Mesa is a pointy-nosed ex fiance and me. If that doesn't count for something, then it says a lot about our partnership. And him. Ricky goes for it. Look, this is a big opportunity. For both of us. He adds. A better deal's not going to walk around the corner. And the ship's in the harbor. And they're pulling up the gangplank. Great, I mutter. And Ricky must have heard it, because his eyes suddenly go wide. But he's looking past me. Behind me. What are you... I hear it before I see anything. Justin, the cashier, is stomping towards us, a filled, dripping steel french fry basket in his hands. No onions here! He shrieks and dumps the bubbling contents all over my friend. There's a huge whoosh as the hot grease and french fries cover Ricky, and the screams drown it out. I scoot back a foot or so in my chair, barely registering what just happened. The cashier looks at me. Here's your large, charring drink, you fuck! He croons 
and swings the mostly empty fryer at me. I lean back and it misses my head, but impacts against my right shoulder, striking hard and spackling me with droplets of hot oil. The pain is intense, and I stumble from my seat. The kid turns his attention to Ricky, who is wimping and clawing at his seared face. I can smell cooking grease and burned hair. Justin, the cashier, slams the basket down on Ricky's forehead once, twice, three times, saying, Char! 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 Each time. He has begun to cry, which is somehow worse than crazed laughter. I rise to my feet, moving as fast as I can, ignoring the pain and looking for some kind of weapon. All there is on the table is my food tray. I scoop up my 48-ounce vanilla Dr. Pepper. Char! I say to the kid, throwing the contents in his face. He stops bludgeoning my friend. Then, before he can recover, 23 years melt away and I become the defensive tackle I played my junior and senior years of high school. I throw my entire 307-pound frame at the kid, knocking him to the floor like a sack full of fertilizer. The cashier goes down hard enough to break a tailbone or two. Oh my god! I hear a female voice say somewhere far away. Someone else chokes out something. I've already called. A man tells them. He's on the phone describing a person being attacked at the Charburger on State Street. I look up from the floor. Ricky sits slumped at the table, his head on his cheeseburger with no onions. He's not moving. He's no longer making any noise. Suddenly a bony knee makes contact with my nuts and the kid beneath me squirms to life. I ignore the pain and, though I was never a wrestler in school, I do my best to pin him to the tile floor. (coughs) He's screaming. A man arrives at my side and I can only see his legs. Justin! Justin, stop! He shouts. The man sounds more like another kid than a boss or the owner. Charburger is a lie! Justin yells from beneath me. He's thrashing and bucking. They don't throw away the food after 20 minutes! We don't share the tip jar! Claude has intercourse with Hadley in his office! Char! The guy next to me leans down, putting a restraining arm on Justin. The guy's black, round... A drive through headset on his head. He says, Justin, calm down, man. You gotta get a g- I gave everything to this place. The kid says beneath me, then snaps at his co-worker, trying to bite his hand. Char! He shrieks for what feels like the hundredth time. The hamburgers are made from my sister! You're all eating red and cool! This he screeches so loud, his voice actually shorts out in mid-sentence. After that, his ranting is weaker, more strained. We've called the police, the girl manager says, not daring to get close enough. I glance up at her. Gosh, she's pretty. Was my wife that pretty when she was ten or eleven? Can you hold him? She asks. Yeah, I say, though he's squirming and jerking beneath me like a wild animal. Rowan takes her glasses off. I'm terribly sorry about all this, she says in the tone of a manager explaining that a credit card machine is down, or they've run out of pickles, or the shakes aren't available in my flavor. I look back up to our table. Ricky has not moved. I can't look at him and hold on to my meal. It would serve Justin right to get puked on, but I force my gaze away, gripping him tighter, keeping my thigh on him to keep him from kneeing my gonads again. On the opposite wall, I see Justin's smiling face staring out at nothing. Next to it is another Justin, the expression the same. He was employee of the month, this month and the last. Good for him. The police come, and before they can pull him out from under me and Jamar, the round black co-worker, I have puked on him. It was the grease and skin smell that pushed me over. Justin's snarling and gibbering now, 
and the cop gags halfway through telling him he has the right to an attorney. That will not be a fun ride to County. An ambulance takes me and Ricky to the Mountain Vista Medical Center down the road. It's new and very nice. I've never been there. My kids were born in the old one. I get two stitches in my neck and treated for second-degree burns. I'm only there for an hour. Rick Entwistle is not so lucky. He is comatose, with severe lacerations, burned flesh, singed but not quite charred, which he would have appreciated, and a fractured skull, and he flatlines three days later. He never regains consciousness. I call his mother and break the news. She assumes he's being fired again and is unsurprised until I tell her again more bluntly. She says he always spoke highly of me the few times he called her. Since I never knew my mother, I cry more than she does. The New Mexico deal comes and goes. Ricky dealt with him, not me. And I wonder if they even wanted me to begin with. My own station's reaction leaves no room for speculation. Our show plays reruns for two weeks before being replaced by the morning trio from the country station. Two men and a woman with a voice like a zombie cheese grater. I get invited onto many radio shows to tell my story, including the team Ricky used to call our nemesises. Even though the money would be nice, so far I've turned them all down. The kid, whose name was actually Justin with an I but changed it himself, is checked into the state hospital on the floor where the patients are not restrained, but are constantly monitored. Marjorie genuinely suggests we go and talk to him sometime, see how he is. I spend the night on the couch, voluntarily. A flood of sympathy and adoration has come in since that day at the restaurant. I got a nice plaque from the office and a nicer letter from our syndicator in Flagstaff the day I cleaned out my desk at the station. I don't know how they know my face, maybe only from the news coverage of the murder, which is a humbling thought, but, but people seem to recognize me and always have compliments about the Big Ben and Ricky show, how it was the best part of their work day, how it made the commute bearable, how Ricky would make some crack and they'd repeat it and get a chuckle, or get a girl to go out with him. I've been told three separate times that Ricky was the funniest guy in the world, and gay Charlton Heston never didn't make them laugh. Yeah. I've never gone back to Charburger. There was talk of closing it, but the morbid publicity actually made it more popular for a while, in a sickening way. I don't want to look at it again so I try not to even drive down that street. I actually avoid burger joints and most restaurants nowadays. I just lost the taste for it. So far, I've lost 17 pounds. A silver lining, I guess. There's always a charring silver lining. The end. everybody welcome back i hope you enjoyed that story i hope you enjoyed the tale of the man bludgeoned to death with a fry basket spoilers come on man dude (laughs) yeah spoiler alert in case you skipped to the end to listen to the uh, post show comments and then you were going to go back and listen to the story one time i got uh called before the uh hr lady <clears throat> at work and i know what you're saying one time yeah i was gonna say one of many one time in particular though i got called into the office and my immediate boss was already sitting there oh snap and the hr lady said close the door please so it's just like okay getting called to the office is one my boss being in there already was two but then close the door please was three <clears throat> And the HR lady said, and I quote, Before we begin, is there anything that you would like to say? And 
I was just like, oh, you know, I, I had no idea what to say. And so what I said was, I'm not here to talk. I'm here to listen. <laughs> <clears throat> That's smooth, man. And uh, it did not help. Oh, it didn't Believe help. me, it did not help. Really, that was my absolute best shot. <laughs> I'm not here to talk. I'm here to listen. And so I thought when you said, okay, so what do you want to say about the story? I was going to say, I'm not here to talk. But uh, I guess I probably am here to talk. I, I mean, that's what we do on the show. Yeah, you are here to talk. Uh, it's our podcast. So if you just listen, then the listeners will just listen to you listen, which is not very interesting. But also it's your story. So the only person that has anything to say about it probably is you. You know, with any uh, authority. I mean, I can pull a bunch of crap out of my butt, but that would be gross. Um, <laughs> well, we we do have an explicit warning already yeah. built into the show. Yeah, yeah, that we do. So, when did you write this story? Have you, it's got to be relatively recently, right? Okay, so this story was written in 2017, October of 2017. Uh, oh, so... There, there's a guy who used to be a fan of ours and uh, hates me now, who would always talk about how much he loved the show and he would want to do his own Broken Mirror story events. And one year he said, I'm going to do my own October scary story event. Would you like to participate? And that was 2017. 2017, if you recall, was the year when you moved away in the summer. Yeah, I recall that. You moved far, far away, and it became clear that we weren't going to be able to get together and eat lunch every single week, as we had done for a decade. You know, podcast, just hang out, go to movies, and all that stuff. And so that was kind of on my mind. And then I was driving down the road, and on my immediate right was the place, this burger place that you and I had gone to, which I based this story on where there, there was a guy behind the counter who was super twitchy. And this, this restaurant had closed. It had gone out of business. It had shuttered it, its doors. And I, I believe I called you and said, oh, hey, look, that burger place. Hey, look, that burger place closed. So you being gone and that burger place shuttering combined to inspire this story. And I decided to write it from your point of view rather than my own, which is the only thing that makes the story even slightly interesting, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it was strange that uh, you had your character get bludgeoned to death by, and I'm sure, I, I can't imagine that the uh, listeners did not notice the uh, similarities, the shades of Dune Steef that were uh, built into that uh, story. The radio show. Big Ben and Ricky. In, in the, the morning. morning. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, I do recall going to this restaurant and meeting the dude that you, is also that this story is based upon. The twitchy guy who... who <laughs> When we ordered a combo, he asked us afterwards, would you like that in a combo? And we're just like, uh, yeah. How else could I get the char burger combo if not in a combo? Oh, well, they, they make us say that every time. <laughs> what? Okay. So when you wrote this story, it was just a lark or is this some kind of like end uh, it, it feels almost like a uh a, what a, a eulogy for the dune steve or something like that well yeah I, th I think that was my intention of writing it that was on my mind at the time because those 10 or 11 years that we got together every week they went by in a flash yeah it's weird how that happened and and you know how people say and people talk a little too much i think but people say that if you do something over and over and over again, you know, it becomes a habit. Your body becomes used to it. Your mind has uh, synapses or something. I, I don't know anything about minds or habits or 
char burgers, but your 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 body gets used to it. It becomes a habit, and uh, the your body thinks that that's how things are supposed to be. And you and me getting together every single Monday for for nearly a decade that was really that was a hard habit to break. <laughs> And I can't go on. Can't go no, on. I can't go on. I can't go on. I can't go on if I'm on my own. I don't even know if that was the right song, <laughs> but I don't know if you felt that because you were put into a new environment with a new job and a, a new wife too, which I found really strange. <laughs> she was just there as she came with the house. Yeah. But my life hadn't changed at all. You know, I was still doing the same thing. Suddenly, you just weren't in it. Podcasting wasn't in it. Eating lunch with you on Mondays wasn't in it. Talking to you in the parking lot of Target wasn't in it anymore. And so it was just this giant void of like, what, what am I going to do? What, what? I don't know. That to me, so this story was my attempting to, in an unusual way, in an offbeat way, write about that. To say goodbye to that previous. Life, yeah, it it was different for me because yeah, I'm I'm here. Everything is new. There are no habits. The only habits that I can have here are ones that I start now, and um, it didn't apply the same to me. I think because yeah, everything was. And I, it's funny because I I still would really like to somehow move back, and resume all that stuff again. I don't know if that's ever going to be possible, because. Things have changed enough that I don't know that that I'll be able to uh, do that. I would really like it because, yeah, a lot of my family lives there. You live there. Uh, You know, I have no friends here still two years later. (laughs) I don't know that I would uh, that I would miss this place all that much if I was to up and go here and there. I might think, oh, yeah, it would be cool to go to the barbecue joint or something. And they don't have any good barbecue here anymore or something. But I think most of my family also would not really miss much of it. Uh, my son moved the heck out of here the second he graduated. He was just like, okay, let me get this robe off. Here, you can have my cap. I'm getting in the car right now. See ya. And yeah, he's back. He lives there with, you know, you could have a podcast with him. He's right down the street from you, man. <laughs> Are you into D&D? He'd probably do a D&D podcast with you. See, wouldn't that be ironic that I would see your son more than you do? Yeah, you totally I'm would. Go have a Sunday dinner with your parents too, just just to be me. <laughs> yeah, send me pictures. Look, I'm hanging out with your parents. They said they like me better than you now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I remember back when we first ran into that guy that was the the helper, the uh employee. And yeah, it was just such an such an odd thing that guy. And I think we talked about it for a while cuz this the, the place that we're talking about here, how many times did we go there? Maybe three I or four? I think I only went with you twice. One time we ate indoors and the other time we ate outdoors, but it was cold and they had put these heaters out there uh, so you could eat in comfort even when it was 30 degrees out. Yeah. But I I I yeah, in my memory you had gone before then and you went after then. But I don't know. It was closer to where you lived. Yeah, that might be it. I I may have gone once or twice with my family, too. And that's how I wildly bloated the number to three or four rather than one or two. But <laughs> well, where, where did char burger come from? Were there multiple items on the menu with char in them or just char burger? I think just char burger was the thing. I don't know if they had char fries and a char shake or <laughs> if they said char in between every other word. Did you want char rings? Char? But I do remember making a great deal of uh, jokes about char you tree when <laughs> we went to this place. Well, explain to everyone but me what char you tree is. <laughs> okay. Well, char you tree is like a, it, I guess it's like a holiday 
from Stephen King's Dark Tower universe. It's kind of like a Guy Fox day or something where you you everybody makes a stuffy guy. Isn't isn't that what they called it? A stuffy guy? Yes. They didn't even call it a stuffy man or a stuffed man or anything. It was a stuffy guy. And you would burn an effigy like you do on Guy Fox Day. Like all Americans do on Guy Fox Day, right? I know I do. <laughs> I mean remember, remember. Whenever it is. You know what's funny? The other day I was talking about Guy... I mentioned Guy Fox Day. And my wife said, Oh, so Guy Fox isn't the same as Terry Fox? Because we always had Terry Fox Day in Canada. They had a gunpowder treason plot as well in Canada. And it happened to be the third cousin of Guy Fox. Terry Fox. Now, Terry Fox was a disabled guy who had, like, a, a leg amputated or something like that. But he would go out and run marathons, and he did, like, this famous run. I, I think he may have run all the way across Canada or something like that. I, I don't... But he's kind of a really well-known hero in Canada. And I think they have a Terry Fox Day... Where, I don't know, you do a good turn daily or something on Terry Fox Day or something like that. So every time she would hear somebody talk about Guy Fox, she would think Terry Fox and confuse the two. And then when I was talking to my kids about Guy Fox Day and I was telling them that, you know, he tried to blow up Parliament and they uh, they burn an effigy of him every, every year. And the masks that they wore in uh, V for Vendetta are Guy Fox masks. And she's like, oh, this is obviously not the same guy. <laughs> but anyways, uh, stuffy guys, back to stuffy guys. So yes, they burn a stuffy guy. Did they ever explain the origin of this holiday? It was, it was a... It was their harvest It was uh, a harvest festival, I think. right? Yeah, and every year they would have a big bonfire, right? Yeah. And ev- everybody in the community would get together and... Uh, it almost seems like that there was something sinister underneath it. Yeah, there was always some kind of witchcraft angle to it. Where if, if the harvest was bad that year, then uh, somebody somewhere had done something wrong. And the Charyu tree ceremony gave you the chance to punish that influence or something. I, it, that's just how I remember it. Yeah, you, you you didn't burn an effigy that year. You burned the the witch that was responsible for the bad harvest or something. But yeah, was it called Charyu Tree, the holiday? Or is Charyu Tree... I, I remember him saying Charyu Tree to... It was something that people chanted at that harvest festival... But I don't, I don't know that the festival was called Charyu Tree. It would, it was. I think it may have just it, been Harvest Festival. Yeah, it was like some kind of ritual of uh, bringing back the the good crop rather than you know we had a bad harvest this year. Yeah, a a lot of the actual old observances and stuff that were surrounding the harvest had some kind of morbid, dark, superstitious undertone to them as well you know what i mean you'll hear about yeah especially about... because summer's coming to an end and you're heading into the long dark cold winter i'm sure in ancient times that was you know a really dangerous time of year and there was a good likelihood that somebody in your family wasn't going to be around come spring did you have enough food to make it through and you know were you going to freeze to death or something was the winter going to be really bad and you didn't make it and so you know they're they're doing those things to kind of ward off that scariness and i suppose that's what most of halloween comes from you carve your pumpkin into a scary face to scare away the bad spirits that might come knocking around your door and you dress up in scary costumes to scare away the bad spirits And you drink lots of pumpkin spice lattes to scare away the sane people. Yeah, you you dress up in your slutty strawberry shortcake costume (laughs) to... uh, I'm not sure what that does to the spirits. Oh, damn. You don't want to see the spirit that saw the slutty strawberry shortcake costume. Woo! That might be a good costume. 
I'd like to see one of those. Do you think they really have one? I, dude, I'm sure there is. What is it? Rule 34? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we did a news story because they came out with a sexy, sold-out Popeye's chicken sandwich costume. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're lying. I really No, do. I'm telling you the truth. Look it up online. You can see the costume. To tell you the truth, it's not particularly good. Uh, it's just basically a bathing suit that looks like a chicken sandwich, and then it says sold out on the bottom bun. I'm, ha- I'm going to have to look up. Sexy strawberry shortcake costume right now just to see what comes up. Oh my gosh, there's tons of them. <laughs> Good. And they are, how oh man. Sorry, we're going to have to end this episode early because I got something I got to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll have, ask people to skip ahead one minute again. Oh, shoot. Sorry. I, I guess it is a good thing that we put the explicit warning on this show. Anyway, we, we we had a story, right? That was <laughs> sort of. I think technically, yes. I guess we could really wrap the char you tree thing back up into this whole discussion because this story is kind of about the end of an era and maybe a descent into what seemed like it could be a cold dark night. Although I guess in the end. We made our way through it. We still exist, and we still manage to keep in touch, to still be friends, to uh, continue on at least about as good as we were doing before I left, which unfortunately wasn't really all that good. We were we were we were already putting shows out at a pretty slow rate, but we were getting together all the time. Yeah, that is true, and that has had to go away although we did get together once since then so there was that twice i guess we got together twice when i was there to visit we did and you're going to be writing all the time so uh yeah yeah that is uh that is the idea have we replayed that one minute now uh i don't think we have do you want to uh maybe we should do that now set that up yeah that that bit where i talked really 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 fast earlier yeah, I was impressed by how you managed that. We're going to switch that up and play it at regular speed now so you can hear what I was talking about. Okay. Basically, um, I have a tendency to make my uh, New Year's resolutions at my birthdays instead of at New Year's. I guess I feel like, oh, I've made it to this milestone and so I feel like I should do something this year of my life because you know the calendar years don't really mean as much to me as my birthday years do because they started on the first one but anyways i was thinking that it would be interesting to set a goal to make this this year my year for writing said so many times that i wanted to be a writer and i've had a few months and even so you know you could even say a quarter where I wrote really heavily, then for some reason I always let it fall away and I stop. And so I thought what I need to do is just give myself one full year and just really devote myself to every day uh, really working on this thing. I turned 45 this year. And I don't know if, if any of y'all listened to the ankle casts back in the day, but when I turned 40, I gave myself five years to become a professional writer, <laughs> to write for a living. Then less than a year into it, I pretty much had fallen on my face and sort of quit. And then I kept having to say, no, 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 I'm still going to do it. And then I'd fall on my face. No, 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 I'm still going to do it. And I'd fall on my face. Yeah, I think what I I told you when I was talking with you on the phone about it, Rish, is that I would make myself do it for a whole year and basically decide once and for all, am I a writer or am I not a writer? Is this something that I love enough that I could do for a year and still want more? Or am I just a poser and I need to give it up and move on to other goals and make use of my life in some other way? So my goal for the year is to write 300,000 words this year. You mean this year 
from birthday to birthday, not yes. end of 2018 or 2019. My goal for the 46th year of my life is to write 300,000 words. And uh, today is actually the day after my birthday that we're recording this. And so the year has begun and uh, I forced myself to sit down and write something today. And I wrote a thousand words, uh, a thousand and thirty two to be exact. So I'm pretty satisfied with that. That's a good start. I will easily make it to three hundred thousand words if I write a thousand words every day. That'll get me what? Three thousand six hundred. Wait, thirty six. 365,000 words. words. There we go. Yes, I'm going to be a writer, not a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't expect to do quite that much. But I'm going to shoot to try and get in the neighborhood of a thousand words uh, every day for this year. You know, I'm rounding it off to 300,000 because there's going to be plenty of days where I don't get a thousand words. But I'm guessing that there's going to be many days where I get. 2,000 or more. Who knows? But yeah, I started a new story today called uh, Active Active Shooter Shooter Training. Training. Yeah, (laughs) truthfully, it's going to be a short one. So I'm probably halfway done with the story already. But yeah, I've got a lot of stuff that uh, I can get onto, including finishing up the second book of Sunny and Gray. Because I've written, I think I've written 100,000 words just on the first and second book of that series so i can't just let it die as it is i've got to finish that and then of course there is uh shoot why was the The gauntlet yes thank you man you know my titles better than i do of course there is also the gauntlet which i did a great deal of prep work on but never actually started writing and so i can get going on that one as well uh, along with other stuff so i'm gonna go for it all right, so we're back from that. Um. <laughs> so when we recorded this story last week, do you remember what bit of direction I gave you before we recorded it? I do remember you wanted me to be like John Goodman in Monsters Incorporated. Uh, I don't know how well I did. Uh, I do know that my throat was sore for at least a day afterwards. <laughs> well, in the editing... Of the story, I came to regret that bit of direction. I didn't mean for you to do a Sully impersonation and for me to do a Mike Wazowski impersonation, but I just saw our two characters as like those, and I I thought that it would help to say, instead of to say, you're playing you and I'm playing me, (laughs) to say, think of Sully and Mike Wazowski, but, uh, oh well, you know... I, so I <laughs> what What about it made you come to regret it? You're just like, oh, God, when is he going to stop doing this stupid voice? It sucks. No, I just, I, I, I think there were times when the accent or the voice slipped. And then there were other times when you were concentrating on having it not slip. And I thought, oh, shoot, we should have just done it as us. Uh, you know, I, I've written a lot of stuff over the years. And a lot of times... I incorporate something that you've told me or something that you and I have experienced or that, you know, real life finds its way into my writing all the time. Uh huh. And uh, the last that gets my goat that we did. I went to a signing, a book signing, uh, a Q and a with Orson Scott card. And he was talking about his writing and he said that, you know, anytime somebody comes over to his house, he warns them that he's a writer and always says, Hey, you got to be careful what you say to me. Because it will find its way in a book. And uh, don't get mad, because it will. And everybody <laughs> around sort of laughed. and that. And, but I, I wondered about it. I wondered, you know, because his stuff, people actually read. Right. And if your words came out of a character in somebody's book that a bunch of people read, I, I, I don't know how people would feel about that. All I know is that I have written things and people have recognized themselves in parts, in characters, in dialogue. And they're not usually thrilled about it. In my mind, it's just like, well, I would love that if somebody took something that I said or a personality trait of mine and put it into a character. 
Well, we've got a friend that incorporated some of my characteristics into a character, and I was flattered as hell. But maybe I'm unusual. I remember a girl specifically being sure that a character in one of my stories was about her, and, and it actually wasn't. And she was upset. And, and you and I, we always talk about that Canadian woman named Kitty Pride <laughs> right. that uh, John Byrne based that character on that, that shakes her fist at him to this day and the living hell that her life has become having a beloved character in pop culture named after her. I don't know. Well, that's what she gets for having a name like Kitty Pride. You know, just goes together it's it's like it's too cat themed to not get used in some way or another do you remember did you ever see that movie it was a woody allen movie and i want to say it was called deconstructing harry i did see it when it first came out i haven't seen it since then yeah neither have i but i saw it in the theater back in the day as a matter of fact i saw it in edmonton canada um (laughs) on a very 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 snowy day (laughs) Anyways, I remember that was something that happened in that movie. Harry was a writer. Of course, in this case, since it's Woody Allen, he would write stories about how he screwed some woman in the closet while the grandmother who was like blind or in half deaf or something was in the other room and was still carrying on a conversation with him while they did it. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, I, 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 I suppose I can understand being upset if that was the story you were included in, especially if it was based on a real event and people that you know were like, hey, I read that story about you screwing Harry in the closet while the grandmother was listening. But yeah, for the most part, I th- would assume that people would be flattered too uh, about having stories. And I maybe I'm lucky my wife doesn't like my stuff (laughs) i think she's not a fan of creepy scary stories uh stuff like that and so in general she doesn't read anything that i write and that's probably good because there's there's got to be enough stuff of her in there that she would be upset eventually she'd be like hey you shouldn't have put this in there this was private but of course i would say no that was what uh Michaela said, McKendra was the one that said that. Not you. What are you talking about? That's a completely different person. It's a made up character. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I often, like pathologically, will name characters after people that I know, specifically about girls that I am interested in or coworkers, people that I went to school with. I had a teacher whose last name was Budikofer. And how many times have you seen Budikofer pop up in my room? Dozens. Dozens. Budikofer. uh, Flickinger. One of my roommates dated a girl, and her last name was Bice. Bice, yes. And we're in the double digits of stories with Bice in them. (sighs) Ah. Yeah, it's, it's something wrong with And Shinugana, Shinugana, you use Shinugana Park. I do use Shinugana a lot, but that is the name of the mountain in Praisden in my, my stories. And so there was like Shinugana Hill and Shinugana Park and... Shinugana anyway. Street. There probably is a Shinugana Street, yeah. And Shinugana Parkway, which actually <laughs> weirdly intersects with Shinugana Street. So you could be at the corner of Shinugana and Shinugana. I think in our career, <laughs> we're at the corner of Shinugana and Shinugana. It's a, a euphemism. Yep. But, yes. I, my and, family and, told me on my birthday, they said, you know, you finally made it to the corner of Shinugana and Shinugana now. It's all uphill from here. <clears throat> yeah, see, so in my mind, I'm super clever for doing that. But it could be that I'm just supremely uncreative. So instead of Michaela or Brexley or whatever you call your characters. <laughs> I just name them after the same people over and over again. I was like, oh, that girl's pretty. Main character. But I, I think the point that I was going to try and make is that I've never had somebody go, oh, you named that character after me? How sweet. 
Never. No. That just that that does not happen. It's always the opposite reaction. <laughs> People <laughs> tend to feel violated that the evil librarian or the captain of the ship or the ship itself is named after you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that is a, that is I suppose an interesting thing. I do recall once that a, we had somebody give us a nice big donation once. And we were like, oh, man, we're going to have to name a character after you in a story. And he, uh, you know, as, as as at least something that we can give you in return, because, you know, you, you didn't ask for anything in return for this gigantic donation. And he was like, well, OK, but if you do name a character after me in a story, please make it the bad guy. It's like, I want to be the bad guy. And I suppose that's the opposite of what I'm sure you deal with most times is they're like why wasn't i the hero you just named me after the ship (laughs) well i think that's maybe the difference between a fan and somebody that knows a writer right this guy is already appreciating the stuff that we do and is happy to be a part of it whereas you know the people that we know feel I don't know, that I guess that we have invaded their privacy in some way or objectified them or anything other than memorialized them forever as the name of the ship. I don't know. <laughs> I wonder how many times Orson Scott Card has been chewed out or something like that for having used something that happened in real life from some random person to the point where he's finally now going, okay, hey, listen, I'm a writer, so... Anything you say can and will be used against you (laughs) in a book by me. That's a good point. I mean, we've talked a lot about him because we both read his stuff at a really formative age. And then I want to say we both went to the same book signing, but probably before we were friends. And, And to me, that's really interesting. There's like, hey, Big and I were at the same place at the same time, but we didn't know each other. It's like one of those Disneyland pictures where your future wife is in the background of the picture. But there was a point I was trying to make. What the? F- oh, do you remember he wrote that story, Lost Boys? And it was in first person. And it was the character was him, was Orson Scott Card. And his character's wife was his wife's name. And the kids were their kids' names. And the town was their town. And it was like insanely personal. And it talked to like little details that were going on in his life at the time and where he was working and people that he knew. That to me was just like, what? what? Is that not just like playing with fire? It's almost like writing a fictional autobiography. Yeah, it was really weird. And I remember when I was in college, there was somebody who did, I don't know what you would call it, a dramatized reading of it or something like that. They actually took a play, I think, that Orson Scott Card had written and they did the play. But then the last thing he did was he just sat down on a chair and read the entire story of The Lost Boys. And I remember being blown away because... Orson Scott Card's kid went to school with us. Like, I knew the guy, not well, but I knew him by name. And, and, he, and was, he was referenced. He was in that story. There, I can't remember what, like, the ending line was, but it's something, like, about how... And he names, like, his two oldest kids or something like that. And they still talk about the day when... What was Simon? Is that what the uh, the fictional kid was? Like, Simon's friends came for uh for christmas for christmas and i remember me and ian who we've also mentioned on the show many times walking out of that and saying should we go talk to uh to what's his face and say hey so tell us about the the christmas when when simon and his friends came (laughs) because it felt it really did like after you've listened you're like oh my gosh this feels like a true a real story a complete confessional because it was couched so much in him when he went back and he did the novelized version he changed everybody's name and that may mean that it wasn't simon's friends because i think simon was the name of the character in you know the novel version so maybe he had a different name in the short story version i can't remember well i i think he said that 
that boy was fictional, you know. Right. That people would come up to him and say, and it's hard to talk about because I'm spoiling the story, but okay. But people would talk to him and say, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you had a child that died. <laughs> and he was like, well, no, I, did, I, I, I didn't. That story didn't really happen. And he's like, but everybody else in the story, well, I just assumed... And that was the thing. That was the power of the story. I mean, hey, it was a really, really good story. You didn't mention, but I was also in that room for the reading of Lost Boys, and I was bawling. <laughs> and I remember going home and just being blown away at the power of storytelling because it wasn't dramatized like the other stories were. They just read the dang story into a microphone, and it was riveting. Yeah. It was basically our podcast, like an early version of our podcast performed live on stage. And uh, at that signing, he said that people still talk to him about it. And uh, and so maybe he regrets doing that. I mean, if you change everybody's name in the novel version, it makes it seem less real and less intimate and less problematic in that way. But I also wonder... If, you know, he used the actual names of his neighbors or his co-workers or the place that he worked or whatever, if that is problematic, if somebody somewhere could be like, hey, you said that I, I showed up to work drunk or, or whatever, whatever, whatever <laughs> thing that you said. And it's like, and that was me. Yeah, I think in a case like that, you know, if you're going to say they showed up to work drunk or whatever, then, yeah, that's when you, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and make up a name for this character just out of thin air. We'll just call him uh, Marshall Latham. You know, some just totally fake name, something like that. Yeah, but the real guy that we'll call, you know, Gail Hilton, he <laughs> reads it and he's like, oh, he called this guy Marshall Latham, but he really means me. He must have noticed that day that I showed up to work drunk. Right. And that, that ends the friendship between, I don't know. I just, I, I, I don't know this story here where the sympathy, hopefully the, the sympathetic main character is you instead of me seems less problematic than if I had been the main character and, you know, you obviously see yourself in the partner of the main character. It's something that I hadn't really done before. I have inserted myself into stories various times as just like there was a guy that interacts with the other characters who is definitely me. But to write a story like this was it was sort of an exercise and uh, it's probably not something I should do a lot. I don't know. I, th I enjoyed it. <laughs> I don't know if you were uh, just specifically looking for my enjoyment out of it. I suppose that probably had to be part of it because I was also a character in it. But th that doesn't bother you in any way. I, like, I think I say you're 317 pounds or something like that. You're 307. And you know, the weird thing was that was freaking spot on. Okay, well... I'm, 307 does... pounds was exactly what I weighed. I want to say the day that I went and found out that I had diabetes... <laughs> Well, see, and now you're thin, too thin, actually. You look like a He-Man villain. Have a cheeseburger. But I wonder, I mean, when you read that, and it, it, you, you put one, uh, you know, all of your 307 pounds of weight into this tackle or whatever, does that not bother you? Because mm -hmm. you're like, this, this guy is definitely me, and the author is saying that he's fat. I mean, I guess it could bother me if I didn't, totally think that i was fat <laughs> if i didn't totally agree with that then maybe yeah maybe it would bother me but it was very much true and it was something that i probably needed to work on so you know i can't be too upset and yeah and maybe it would be more upsetting if i hadn't already worked on it but i weigh 80 pounds less than that now Maybe I maybe I might be more upset if I was still that. So you you've lost an entire Natalie Portman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. I was laying out in the sun in my hammock that I have, and my seven year old son came and he climbed in the hammock with me. 
you know, a while ago I might have thought, oh crap, uh, maybe he shouldn't get in here with me because that might exceed the weight limit on this thing and we could be asking for it to just rip and fall down on me. But us two together is the same as me alone sitting in this hammock a little while ago, so it's probably fine. It didn't fall on me then, so it shouldn't fall on me now. It is sometimes interesting to think about that. Just how much extra weight I was carrying around. Imagine throwing a backpack on your back that weighs like 80 pounds and just walking with it all day long. I don't know how I could do that. And yet that's what I did and I did it for years. Well, I I aspire. I hope that one day I can weigh 80 pounds more than I do and walk around carrying it. Good Um, luck. Just keep eating a charburger. You'll get there. (laughs) <laughs> get the onions, get the char rings, in fact. Be sure to put lots of fry sauce on your char fries and be sure to get a char shake with each uh, purchase. I will. And each one of those fries that I put in my mouth, I will dedicate to you. That's right. I believe in our first episode ever, we learned that every fry you eat takes one minute off of your life. <laughs> I should uh, be watching the clock then, man. Because it's like, oh, okay, I need to get my affairs in order. Uh, We also learned in that episode that kissing a girl might add one minute to your life. So you definitely need to get your affairs in order. (laughs) That's funny that you remember that. Well, so uh, there we go. That was the story. I hope that people liked it. People that weren't you. That's it. Right on. Well, I guess it's time to uh, say goodbye to all our company. F-U-C. See you real soon. (laughs) K-E-Y. Wait, that doesn't work. Doesn't it? We will be back again. This is not our final episode. Uh, Unless it is. And there is irony there. But uh, (laughs) we have plans for more episodes. Yeah, it won't be on purpose if this is our final episode. But yeah, that's I was actually thinking about saying that when we were talking before. Just saying that maybe we should have saved this story and used it. Added it to our final episode or something like that. Because uh, it would have been really good for it. But we already recorded our final episode years and years ago. So I guess we didn't need it. But yes, we will be back. Captain America will return. Willie, Big Anklevich? Willie. Well, I suppose I don't know about Captain America anymore. But somebody will return. Spider-Man? Yeah, I think for one more. Right on. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. I've been Ben... I've been Big Anklevich. And I have been Rish Outfield. And char thee well, Big. That's right. Char U Tree. The Dune, Dune Steve is released, released under, under a Creative, Creative Commons, Commons attribution, attribution, non-commercial, no, no derivatives, derivatives license. license. So, so you, you can, can give, give it, it to anyone, anyone but, but you, you cannot, cannot change it or make, make money, money off it. Believe, Believe me, me, we know that, that from experience. experience. Skull. Skull, skull, skull. You will will die die by the end of this story. story. Ricky makes a wet, uh, somehow dis... Ricky makes a wet, somehow disappointed sound with his mouth. There isn't an offer from Phoenix. The opportunity knocking is in New Mexico. Wait, I want to hear a wet, somehow disappointed sound with your mouth. Let's, let's do this for like 10 minutes and just have it be outtake. I'm not sure. It's either not disappointing enough or not wet enough. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think it needs more wetness to it. Let me go grab a drink. I'll be right back. <laughs> Jimmy, what are you doing in there? <laughs> Nothing, Ma. Why is the door locked? I was uh, I was just changing. I, I, I'm I'm smoking weed, Mom. <laughs> Don't come in. Uh, New Mexico. Okay. 
The teen who rang us up is wiping down tables, visibly twitching. I wouldn't go so... (laughs) I take another bite. Chartreuse means yellow. Do that with your mouthful. Oh. Chartreuse means yellow. Ricky, take... Was that okay? (laughs) It just sounded really disturbing. (laughs) <laughs> like, like some kind of, you know, like the guy that says one quarter portion in, fant- in uh, whatever you call that show, uh, Force Awakens. Okay. Yeah, the guy that played by uh, Simon Pegg. Yeah. I wonder if he's back in this movie. Well, I guess you may know having watched that trailer. Oh, he's back and he's the lead character. I love it. Ricky takes it in stride. Scott. Skull, skull, you will die. You have died. Actually, no, you die in the hospital, right? Yes, sir. Our show plays reruns for two weeks before being replaced by the morning trio from the country station. Two men and a woman. Two men and a woman with... Two men and a woman with a voice like zzzz, Like two men and a woman with a voice like a zombie cheese grater. Two men and a woman with a voice like a zombie. Damn it. Keep stumbling over this shit. Two men and a woman with a voice like a zombie cheese grater. I get invited onto many radio shows to tell my story, including the team Ricky used to call the... The... End. Char. We can record a little outtake here. So when you read the story, you told me that I needed to change one of the cities because I had my geography wrong. But then the other thing that you said was that I needed to make the fate of the main character more clear. And so I took five or six minutes to add a a paragraph in there. But I didn't, when you said that, I didn't feel like I needed to. I felt like, well, it's really, it should be clear what happened to him. But I'm wondering what you thought of that addition. Did that make all the difference or did that still not satisfy? No, it was satisfying. I, I, sadly, I actually, when I went, but when we did go back and re- actually read it through and I got to the part and you said something and I went, oh, geez, he probably made it clear enough already. I, it was more my fault than your fault. that <laughs> I just kind of wasn't paying, I guess, enough attention when I read it and kind of missed the part where you made it more clear. And I felt like, oh, shoot. I just made him spend all this time working on it for nothing. But I th- I do think that it was it was good still. I, I, I don't think that the stuff that you added took anything away from it. No, I liked adding a couple more details. I added the little part where uh, he got a nice plaque from the office and a letter from the Flagstaff station the day that he cleaned out his desk. Right. Um, but that was it. I just I, I just wanted to ask you that, and I figured we were still recording, so I could ask you uh, as an outtake. Now I'm regretting having done that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're regretting having added the details and having had me read the story ahead of time so that you had to add the details and having me as your co-host at all. And and the many french fries I've eaten and the many girls I have not eaten. Ooh. So, uh Oh snap. No you didn't. No, I didn't. I pressed the button. <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 